What got you there with got you got you? What got you there with Sean Delaney? I'm Sean Delaney, and on this episode of What Got You There, I sit down with legendary value investor Guy Spear. Guy is the founder of the Aquamarine Fund and also author of the great book, The Education of Value Investor. But this conversation isn't only about investing. It's so much more about Guy's own journey and the exploration of our own internal inner game. Guy Spear, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? It's, I'm doing great, Sean. Even better for talking to you. Slightly nervous for talking to you, but uh, it's great to be here. The, the, believe me, the, the nerves are over here on this side. Uh, <laughs> there, there's so much we, we can learn from you and distill down. And this conversation, I'm hoping, is really going to be a lot about exploring the inner journey. And I, I know you, you've studied different people, learned from so many. And someone I want to start with, actually, who, who unfortunately has recently passed, is James Cars. And, and he wrote this great book, uh, Finite Infinite Games. And James Cars yeah. was, was a guest we were lucky enough to have on episode 182. But his whole concept in the book, Finite and Infinite Games, I'm just wondering for you, what type of impact has the thinking about playing finite and infinite games? I mean, you know, what, um, uh, it's funny because it came up today uh, in I was playing squash with a friend before I got to you. That's why my hair is slightly wet. And uh, he brought up the version of that idea that was put across by Simon Sinek, which in many ways has been um, far more popular. But but I did not realize, and and I'm not I, I know I'm not a dummy. Uh, I didn't realize how important it is to play the infinite game. So uh, I'm still learning. And I'll just give you one example that came out of my life in the last couple of weeks. So I really wanted to be back in Zurich now. Um, but they put the UK back onto quarantine rules in that I would have had to spend 10 days at home, not leaving the home. It's very strict in Switzerland. So there's a Delta variant, the India variant, and but I had a workaround that I could have implemented. The workaround would have been to take the train from Paris, and Paris doesn't have any quarantine with the UK, and Switzerland doesn't have any quarantine to France. So I would have just had to kind of in a certain way slip across the border, so to speak, and I would have been fine. And I think that the guy spear of 10 years ago would have done that. And actually, my wife was egging me on to do it. And what I realized was that if I, if I did it, the people who knew would be my staff, just my staff and my family. And the, the question arises, why should I expect others to play by the rules, for example, that I've set for my fund? Uh, we have redemption restrictions. You can only redeem at certain times. And those are rules that we've set up. How can I expect them? to abide by those rules when my staff see that I'm not abiding by rules that may be stupid, but they were set by the Swiss government and they're set with the expectation of, um, of us complying with those rules. So what on earth has that got to do with the infinite game? It's got to do with the infinite game because if people see that you're willing to play by the rules and not skirt by the rules, that makes you a trusted player in many other games. And um, I didn't realize that. So there's, there's just one example of how that thinking is still evolving in my life. I'll give you another example is that if you make any amount of money, you'll get tax advisors who will recommend tax strategies, which are more or less aggressive. And I've come to the realization that the standard by which I judge sort of tax minimization strategies is not, is this legal? That's like sort of what you really want to get to, I believe, and I've been talking about this to various people around me, is that um, the, the tax man, the tax inspector, when he looks at the tax return, should look at it and go, yeah, he's okay, or this company is okay, and should give him that good feeling, these people are okay. Because in theory, your tax return is private and uh, not for public consumption. In practice, people talk and people know who you are. And so that idea of people unquestioningly knowing that you, you're, you're looking to pay them a fair amount of tax and you're not looking to push the law to the extreme 
means that they'll say good things about you. And as a result, you'll be invited into other things. You'll get the opportunity to do more than if you pushed it to the extreme. So, so I think that, you know, interestingly enough, just to go to a completely different area, I think this is from one of the Jordan Peterson talks that I've listened to recently. Apparently, even dogs, when they play with each other, a dominant dog will allow a non-dominant dog to win a certain amount of the time. So this idea that, that if you want to get invited back into the game, even if you're way, way better than your opponent, you need to allow them to win. And I think maybe it all comes back to you know, this simple idea that Warren Buffett has that whatever, uh, whenever you have an interaction with somebody, make it, make it a rule to leave, to leave them feeling, for them to leave the interaction feeling like they won big time always to leave them like they won big time. And it's so hard to be strategic in life about what's going to unfold next. But that's a simple heuristic rule that if one starts applying it, and I, I so, so before I sort of hand the mic back to you, Sean, I think that it's such a powerful idea that I am only starting to understand and explore the implications of it. And I'm starting to realize the many ways in which I haven't actually fully implemented its lessons in my own life. And, and smart people around me don't understand that that's the real game. You know, the game is not to win. I mean, how many times have you or I seen a resume that says I play to win? <laughs> and, and the problem with that, that the idea or the emotion expressed behind that is that, you know, you're trying to win every single game. You're actually not trying to win every single game. You're trying to make sure that you get invited back to the series of games that are being played in life. And in order to be invited back, you may voluntarily lose quite a bit of the time uh, because that's how you get invited back. So, uh, so for example, I voluntarily lost in the game of getting back to Switzerland this time around, uh, even though I could have pushed the rules to win uh, because I knew that long. And that's actually, it just comes back to me. It's what Warren Buffett is saying when he's talking about long-term greedy. You know, it is actually self-interest. It is actually greedy, but it's greedy in a very in a way that that works, if you like. So, um, yeah. How how did I do, Sean? <laughs> no, no, I I love this. Well, your book, The Education of a Value Investor, that that came back out back in 2014. When when I first read that back then, I remember thinking, oh wait, this is all about compounding goodwill. That that like I, I walked away from the book. That's what it seemed like, at least. Yeah. Uh, is, is that how, how you think about things most of the time? I, I know you're playing the infinite game, but it, it, is it about compounding goodwill? I mean, it, it certainly is. But, but just to give you a sense, Sean, so, you know, so, so the, the way I've described my writing that book is, um, and I, I don't know where I read the story, but so the king is standing on the balcony of his estate, which overlooks a river, and he's got assorted courtiers there. And um, he has a beautiful daughter that can be married off. And he's, part of the purpose of the event is to figure out who his daughter gets married off to. And um, uh, so, so suddenly they see a man who is on the other side of the river who's being chased by lions. And he's doing everything he can to get away from the lions. And then he has to swim across the river, which has got alligators in it. And he somehow manages to wrestle three alligators and gets across the river. And then, um, uh, and then he, he's up on the balcony and the king says, I, I offer you anything in my kingdom. What would you like, including my daughter? And the man says, I just want to know who put me next to the river in the first place. <laughs> and and, and I, the, what I'm trying to say is that the process by which my book got written and every book has its own story is that I suddenly found myself in an analogous position to that man where I'd accepted a contract to write the book uh, and I knew that I had a delivery date. And I, now I was just in a state of utter terror as to what I was gonna write for the reader. And the only things that I knew was that I knew the title of the book was going to be The Education of a Value Investor, but that could have covered any number of things and I knew that at some point I was going to talk about lunch with Warren Buffett because I knew that that would be good for book sales. Uh, but I didn't know anything else. And, and I certainly spent a few months with all these kind of like useless 
schema and ideas about how to teach people about investing. And it was, it was in a state of, so, so I had, and this is an interesting thing, this idea of when you commit to an outcome. So I had committed, I realized that come hell or high water, this book is going to, I'm going to deliver a manuscript and this book is coming out. And so the, the terror, and it really is, I mean, it's not terror for my life. I knew that I wasn't going to die, but I was terrified because this was going to be my perhaps only book that I've written for the world and could, could have would set my reputation with the vast majority of people who would never meet me. And what was this going to be? Was it going to be a second or a third or a fourth rate book? Or was it going to be the best that I could do? And thankfully for me, I figured out pretty quickly that uh, the only thing I could really do that would deliver real value to the reader was to show up myself and give as honest an account as I possibly could of my experiences with the world. And so I wasn't at the time thinking of playing an infinite game. Uh, I was just in utter terror trying to make, trying to do the best I could, trying to make it, give a good account of myself, if you like. And so, you know, it's easy in retrospect to say, oh yes, Sean, I had, I was playing the infinite game, you know? No, I was in utter terror trying to give a good account of myself with the extraordinary help of a few people. So at that point, I've already met Warren Buffett. I've recently read the autobiography of Mahatma Gandhi, and I've read this book by uh, David Hawkins, uh, Power Versus Force, and Monish Pabra is my friend, and he exemplifies this idea of sort of um, honesty and truthfulness, and that using that as a way, complete 100% honesty and truthfulness about my, oneself with the world um, to go places. So with those mentors as guideposts, I ended up by some miracle in my state of terror, writing in an honest way about myself, and in a certain way, to your point, falling into the infinite game. And, um, and you know, I, I, I don't know if you have children. So obviously, these are all things that we want to teach our children. But I, I don't think that you or I would be very effective if we sat down with our children and started saying, oh, you, you, you need to play the infinite game. Mm -hmm. And so funnily enough, uh, I just, we, so I'm holding this up. So for those of you who are listening, uh, this is a, a letter that I received today from my daughter. It's hand addressed. I'm just showing it to Sean, Sarah Spear. So we like, my wife and I teach our children to do handwritten notes and we've had varying degrees of success. And it's only actually now, uh, Sean, that I realize that those handwritten notes are a way of playing the infinite game. But I didn't realize it that at the time. So, well, I, I'd love for you to even double click a little bit more on handwritten notes and the impact these have had on your life. Yeah, and and what I would tell you now is that they're a they're really to describe handwritten notes as a shortcut for something far bigger. But but for your interest, Sean, and for the listener, it's as so. I'm like. Um, very frustrated with myself and the world. And I know I'm not making the progress that I should. And there's a part of my, I think that there's a part of my mind, my wife, Laurie, for the first time, she, she accused me of being Aspergerish. I don't know if that's true or not. But there's an element to which I kind of do things without an understanding that it, that that what I'm doing is socially awkward. And so there's three notes a day, 15 notes a week, I literally, I'd read in Robert Cialdini's book about the salesman who was so successful, and I was determined to get more successful. I knew that the strategies I'd used to date had not worked. And so I just took this one thing and I pushed it to the extremes of these. Um, literally, there were many days. I know, I remember the office. So the office was 40 West 55th Street, which was actually an apartment building. Uh, just off Fifth Avenue, like if you walk off from Fifth Avenue on 55th Street in New York City, there are kind of apartment buildings. And I'd realized that I could get more space by renting an apartment building than by renting an office. So there's a two bedroom apartment. And uh, my office was in one bedroom and the living room was kind of the reception area. And um, 
so many days I would not leave be, because I hadn't written my three notes. So I'd write, I'd scroll three notes to the most ridiculous people. And I remember my friends laughing at me for it because I started developing a reputation for doing it. Um, but the bigger, the, 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 the handwritten notes is really just a microcosm of, of a far bigger principle. So I'll just give you one example of it. Um, so at, at the, at the, famous lunch with Buffett with me and Monish Pabrai, um, uh, he stayed way longer than we ever expected him to stay. You know, that was another way of him kind of leaving more on the table. He's always, Warren Buffett is always going to find a way, if he possibly can, to leave more on the table, to leave you feeling like you won way more than you ever expected to, which is kind of what happens when I receive a handwritten note. I mean, I never expected to receive something from my daughter and there it is. And it's like, oh, she took the time to think of me. And so it took me a long while to realize that the handwritten note is just a sh kind of a shorthand for something far bigger. And so, um, you know, I mean, just something I was realizing recently uh, it was about five or four years ago now that I realized there's an organization called Entrepreneurs Organization, EO. And at the time, they didn't have an Israel chapter, which seemed to be, me to be ridiculous, given that Israel is such a center for entrepreneurship. And I went to that and started, founded that chapter, sort of like committed myself to that result. And, um, and that was in a certain way, it was kind of a way of writing a thank you note to EO, if you like, because EO had had a huge impact on me. I'd learned so much from the organization and, and it was a big thank you note to EO. I mean, it took a lot of time, energy and effort, but so one can't just stop at the thank you notes. There, one can actually have an enormous amount of fun um, of finding creative ways to make people feel great that uh, I'm alive and that they're the recipient in the same way that my daughter's just done it with this. And I hope that she doesn't stop, she doesn't leave it there. She goes on to doing um, many other things. And just another idea that actually I would tell you that pretty much all of my experiments in this direction have failed. So I've, so here's my theory, Sean. <laughs> so, uh, and I kind of share this with interns, but none of them, I don't think anyone has actually implemented it. So, uh, you know, write, it's along the lines of write a hundred thank you notes and you'll get yourself a good job or a job, write a thousand, you'll get yourself a good job, write 10,000 and you might be able to start your own business, a hundred thousand and you've probably got a nice business and a million, now, now you're really going places. But, but this idea that is very uh, common in um, sales training literature, which is, you know, you need to have a thousand calls before you get to a sales result. So don't treat calls number one to 999 as a failure just because you didn't get the result. Treat them as, you know, that you have to just pass through those in order to get to the success. And that's certainly true, by the way, of writing, which is in order to write the good stuff, you have to just write a lot of garbage. And one of the problems that I think that I have certainly and many others do is that it's just hard to get through all the garbage. There's just a lot, a lot there. So um, I, the way I try to describe it to my interns is that you're filling a bucket, but the only way you can fill the bucket is with drops of water from shaking a cloth. You can't mm. switch on a tap. And when that bucket is full, and there's water sloshing over the sides every time you carry it somewhere, that is kind of a bucket that's overflowing with goodwill. That's when your life really takes off. But, but the first thing that one has to do is just fill that bucket. And there's a very, very long time that filling that bucket will take, could take 20 years before it's full and it's overflowing with goodwill. Um, and, uh, and most people give up. <laughs> and... But if you can just keep going, if you can enjoy the process, the rewards at the end are really just extraordinary, just extraordinary. And yeah, go ahead. No, no I'm just wondering if, if that mindset, that ability to, to take on these failures, is that you just have that because you lived through that? Because I'm wondering, you just mentioned telling this to, to younger people. I'm wondering if those are experiences that you have to live. You, you can't just read that in a book. You know, um, so it's interesting, Sean, because I think that what really pushed me to take that view of the world 
was to have a humongous failure and a failure that really took me down and threw me back on myself. And my decision to go and work for D.H. Blair, this uh, very sleazy investment bank, not dissimilar to the firm Stratton Oakmont in Wolf of Wall Street was, I mean, I, I was what I describe in the first chapter of my book. I mean, I was disgusted at myself and I was disgusted at the world. And, um, and I, I, I had to find a new way of developing success. The approach that I'd taken, which was kind of like, you could maybe summarize it as, um, you know, young, arrogant man in a hurry, hmm. you know, and the world appeared to me to be full of young, arrogant men in a hurry who had succeeded. And I was like, you know, and, and that's a kind of, there's an element to that, which is lottery ticket. Yeah. If you have a million, people of a certain age doing their very best to succeed by quote raping and pillaging or by by burning their relationships there are going to be a few who are going to stumble across a lottery ticket and succeed and those are the ones you're going to read about you're not going to read about all the ones who fail and the vast majority do fail and so you know you're kind of like thrown into so I, I've, I've successfully left, but now it's like, how do you pick up the pieces? And I think that it's in that environment of utter failure and having nothing much to lose that you can start trying new strategies, if you like. And so I was still young enough and flexible enough of mind that I was willing to just try it. But I think that also, well, I, what I tell you, Sean, is that, so, so one thing is if you write thank you notes, by definition, the reward doesn't come right away because you're putting it in the mail and you're sending it off. So there's the expectation that if anything good comes of it, it may come at minimum, it's going to take two or three days for the mail to be delivered for the person to have a reaction and for it to come back. But I think that when I started seeing some extraordinary results out of it, like like ending up going for lunch, uh, for a dinner with, with Monish Pabrai, and there were others that that at that point i think that my whole orientation to doing it changed because at that point i realized that it wasn't any single one but in a certain way every one was a mini lottery ticket that could have tremendous rewards and we just didn't know which one and so i i developed the sense of anticipation and excitement as i was doing that because and you kind of like if you kind of want to get to a place where the investments we're making today, we are kind of like, they'll, they'll reward us in five, 10, 15 years time. Meanwhile, we're re reaping the rewards of the investments that we made five, 10, 15 years ago, and kind of like expanding that envelope. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that I've become more able to, uh, that was the beginning of me expanding that envelope, if you like. Um, yeah. Well, I'm just curious today. I mean, it's clear and, and obvious how much thought has gone into this. And, and I, I love the thought of writing thank you notes. Luckily, that was something instilled in me uh, from my parents really early on. It's, it's one of those things that, yeah, you, you never know when one of those things are, are going to come back to you, but they, they end up coming back to you. So, so I'm wondering for you today, what are some of these other, we can call them non-negotiables that, that you tend to, to implement in your own life? Um. So holding myself to standards, if you like, of like that three notes a day, for example. Um, so I think that, that there's this strange, um, there's a counter counter counterintuitive thing that happens if you have any any degree of success, which is there's a certain amount of friction that I need to overcome now that I didn't used to have to overcome. So um, uh, I I find. So at once, the writing that I did for that book and other writing that I've done has, I think, been psychically and in terms of becoming a better human, uh, the most rewarding uh, activity that I've, I've done. Uh, but it is at the same time, the most painful. <laughs> Can you ex expand I, on that? You know, there's a there's an article that I, I want to write for a friend of mine, and uh, I haven't yet written it because it's too freaking painful to write. But so I had a f conversation with somebody who's a um, life coach, 
And he kind of said to me, oh, I haven't really written much. I don't think I'm much of a writer because whenever I sit down to write, uh, it's too painful. And it switched something on in me. And I know some people who write copiously who find it very easy to write, but I don't think that they write particularly well. Mm -hmm. And so I developed this theory that the people who write the best are the ones who are willing to go to a painful place. And the, the work of writing well is extraordinarily painful because what you're actually doing is you're sitting down at the, with your notepad or computer, you're trying to work out what you really think. In a certain way, you're kind of rearranging the furniture internally. Mm -hmm. And that is painful and difficult. And uh, so in terms of, quote, non-negotiables that you asked me about, I think that I would be a far better person if I were to um, discipline myself to sit down and write 500 words a day. Uh, but I find it very hard to discipline myself to do that because it's just extraordinarily painful. Uh, it would be a bit like, um, you know, I'd be a far fitter person if I did hill runs every morning. Uh, but boy, is that a freaking painful <laughs> and difficult thing to do. So, so I actually struggle with, with the, you know, I, I struggle with how do I want to spend my time? And I have enormous, enormous respect for the people who are willing to spend their time writing and willing to put themselves in that painful place in order to deliver something for the rest of humanity. I think that the, the non-negotiable, so, so I'm not sure that I want to do that because it's this trade-off between, you know, I, I want to enjoy my days. <laughs> You know, and I'm not sure that it's a it's an interesting question because I I've asked some some there's I have a friend who who writes for the Sunday Times in the UK she reviews books and I've asked her and she says yeah it is painful but I really like the result you know and my friend William Green who's just finished this extraordinary book and and I I really am in awe of him because. I just have a very good sense of exactly how much pain it is to do what he does. And, and it's just enormous. And so, so that is, I guess what I'm saying is that that is a, you said non-negotiables, that is a an, quite possibly a non-negotiable that I ought to hold myself to that I have not held myself to. I think that what I find myself struggling with right now is that to if you're if you have nothing and you devote yourself 100% of your time to having something to having financial security then that is an extremely laudable not just laudable it's a um it's a virtue to do that it's important um successful societies need people to do that we don't want people to be wards of the state but if you've been lucky enough that through hard work and some luck you've achieved financial security to spend to devote the next 20 years of your life getting more of the same stuff when we know that more of it doesn't actually make a contribution is kind of asinine it's just a dumb idea and so i find myself in a place where i now have financial security and I find myself really questioning what the motivation is of all these people who seem to have utterly devoted themselves in the world of business to taking a very, very high net worth and making it even greater. And that cannot be the answer. And so the question of how to live life in the most meaningful way possible, and holding myself to that standard, that is, is something that I'm still figuring out. And actually, Sean, I think it's got to do with sort of you know, making the world beautiful in your own, own image. So finding ways to interact with people in such a way that they leave the world or they leave the interaction feeling like, um, you know, they're happy that I'm in the world and they're happy that they're in the world. And, uh, but that's, and, and so that's, that's challenging, but there's a part of me, there's a part of me that would be quite interested. So I'm very sorry that I didn't study more mathematics at university. I was a law student then an economic student. So the part of me that thinks that maybe I should just go and study mathematics for a few years. <laughs> um, 
yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> oh, I love where the conversation's going. It, it reminds me, I, I have a framework I, I at least tr try to live by, and that's essentially be a great ancestor. So we're thinking about putting good things out into the world that we might never see, never reap the rewards of. But for people way past us, um, they're going to be able to experience that. It's kind of thinking, like, let plant a tree today that's not going to grow and then bloom for 100 years. Um, it seems like you're kind of operating from that. I, I, I'm curious, though, talking about that resistance, that pain of writing. Are you familiar at all with Stephen Pressfield's work, The Art of War? The War of Art. The oh, sorry. Yeah, the, war. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, the War of Art. Yeah, going, going towards the resistance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do the work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do the work. <laughs> <laughs> 100 percent. yeah I, I thought that might be right up your alley i yeah. i am wondering though you kind of talking about trade-offs and, and living the life you want to live and a, a lot of us have the the balance or trying to figure out the balance between family work all of those things i know you put a tremendous amount of thought into that how do you balance all of those demands on your yeah. time yeah it's a great question i just before we go there because i think it's such a gem that you that you, that you dropped that i haven't heard before which is just so wonderful is you reframed the question of how to live well as to how to be an awesome great grandparent to your great grandchildren. And that, that is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful reframing. And I think that I see people around me who I think that if they thought in those terms would see things and do things differently, be the person that your great grandchildren will be proud of is actually, you know, I, you could, you could, you could create a whole retreat, for your friends around that exploring that question and 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 i just want to tell you that it's kind of makes me <laughs> makes me pause and makes me think what what is it with that perspective that i should do and what am i not doing and and for you know i i think that men especially don't realize i think women are just closer to their children and um they do realize but the example that we set for our children in so many ways in so many small ways, our children know us the best, they observe us the most, and they see what we don't see. And the idea that we can keep any one of our behaviors hidden from our children. Uh, so another way actually to, to, put, to put the challenge is, you know, be, be, be the hero that you want your children's to children to have, aspire to that. And actually, I, I, I can tell you that I think that there, there are probably clear ways that I fall short of that on my own yardstick, which is that I've been, so I realized not so long ago that I actually have a high anxiety set point. And so the search for or the desire to achieve financial security has been great. Uh, but if you really want to be a hero, if I really want to be a hero to my children, I need to be about more than just financial security. And there needs to be, and I certainly, charity brings begins at home, having a healthy, stable family and providing for your children is certainly a good place to start, but it shouldn't end there. And I think I'm lacking, in, not lacking is the wrong word, but I think that there's something to be explored there. And obviously it has to be consistent with who I am. I think that just coming to your question about um, work-life balance, it, I, it's so dependent on who one marries and I feel that in a certain way, I, I'm really lucky, uh, so lucky that it would be hard for me to answer the question in a way that is helpful to your listeners, because my wife and the mother of our children is jealous of my time. She's jealous for it, of the, the uh, family life that we have, and she's tough as nails. She's not going to concede ground. So um, I think that there's a huge part of me that wants to save money and make money. And, 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 and she's, she represents a very, very different set of values of, uh, no, we spend some money now and we spend time with our children. We don't seek to optimize that sort of like narrow professional vision that you have for yourself. And I think that when, you know, my, the, the view that I have of good relationships, both in work and in marriage, is that it is absolutely fine to be married to somebody who's very, very different to you, because they they kind of like, you know, this idea that the we're all holding on to an elephant that represents reality, and we're all blind, and some of us are holding on to the tail, some of us are holding on to the trunk. 
but the process, but you, you know, the process by which you figure out what part of reality the other person is holding on to, and you don't deny them their reality, you respect the reality, and you try and understand where the differences are, and you know, to to stand in two different places, and then to um, to seek to sort of not to not to neutralize the difference, but in a certain way to celebrate the difference and find the way to move back and forth between the two. So, for example, it took a long time. It took like a probably a decade of going on holidays where after about three or four days, I was going nuts and needed to go to work. And so now if we're if we're on any kind of family trip in the in the, the last 10 years, um, you know, my wife will schedule in days where I just go to a Regis office center and plug myself in and 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 get stuff done. And that puts me in a far better mood. And so that's kind of like, it's not like we're not going on holiday. Uh, it's not like, um, but it's not like she she knows. So so finding that kind of um, the ability to 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 move between those two worlds and find a dialogue between those two worlds is actually what sets the relationship up for success, and it also sets the um, uh, it sets your children up for success because they kind of see this stereo vision. And I actually think that's true of teams. Um, I'm not I'm not particularly good at managing in teams, but we, I have a small team that, that helps me to run the Aquamarine Fund. And uh, I, I think that you know, when somebody comes up with something that I disagree with, the goal is to really sit with them and understand that it's coming from a place that I don't yet understand. Is It's part of that dialogue. You know, they're not wrong. <laughs> they're holding on to a piece of reality, and we need to identify that piece of reality, understand in what circumstances that response or that idea is valid. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's a look, I, I think that it's worth saying, Sean, that I've asked myself questions as to, so I, I'm in a traditional marriage. I, I am the breadwinner and uh, I have a career, a, a professional career. My wife is a homemaker and she has very much a career if you like, within the home. Um, and and she, she does an extraordinary job. I mean, just to give you one sense, I, I did not have a good relationship with my sister when my wife and I got married. I now have a far better relationship with my sister and it's because of the work that my wife has done. So, uh, and she's managed to do all sorts of really wonderful things um, inside our family. But I think that I, I don't have much to say that's valid in a relationship where both couple, both sides of the couple, let's say, are have a professional career and are active in the home. And um, I think that in many ways is far more challenging, but also potentially far more rewarding and potentially far healthier for the children if one can get there. Yeah, you brought up a point a minute ago. I would I would love to explore a bit further, um, and that's I, I love the analogy there, uh, holding on to different parts of the elephant there, and how people are, are viewing reality. Reality, how important and impactful has that been for when you're parsing out different investment ideas, being able to kind of turn the tables and view things from a different angle? Has that been a critical component for you? I mean, you know, I, somewhere else, it, um, I. Uh... I, I use this analogy and I pause because, because it kind of, I don't think it reflects me in a good light, but you know, this idea of drunks and bars, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you've, so the, the, the idea, the image that many people have as of investors and kind of like what I react to and what you're saying is that it implies that I'm this sort of like this brilliant guy who's carefully examining investment opportunities from different perspectives and, you know, taking the other person's shoes and seeing how they see it. And, um, <laughs> you know, the, the way I see, I, I kind of see myself as a drunk in a bar. And, you know, if I'm a drunk in a bar, you want to keep the alcohol far away, you want to keep the soft drinks nice and easy to reach. And so I, I am approaching the investment challenge, trying to, without the assumption that I'm a rational human, I've in a certain way taken on board all of this behavioral psychology. Assume I'm not a rational human. Assume I'm gonna do a whole bunch of stupid stuff. And so 
Uh, I would tell you, Sean, that I feel like the vast majority of what I'm doing when it comes to my investment practice is another another way of, of describing it is bowling with when you go to the bowling alley and you've got the, the curtains up for children. Yep. I'm just constructing those curtains. You know, I just want to find a way. I'm not trying, I'm not working on my my the quality of my bowling. I'm not working on my technique. I just want the bowling. I just want all of those rails up there so that they kind of lead the ball right to where it's going in the assumption that my bowling technique will never be any good. And, um, and, and so for what it's worth, I think that that's just the approach that has worked for me. I think there are some people who are utterly brilliant um, in being able to judge risk and to time when they buy something, when it's extraordinarily cheap to buy when others are fearful. Uh, and I'm not one of those people. <laughs> well, I, I think the, the process of self-correction kind of begins with self-knowledge. And, and so it seems like you've done a very good job in, in really understanding who you are and aligning who you are with the strategies, whether they be investing or your family life that best work for the totality of all of that. Yeah. And I think partially that, that might be where the genius yeah. lies. So that's, yeah, this idea of to thine own self be true, uh, know yourself. But it's so, yeah, yeah, it's this diving into oneself and, and kind of really coming to terms with one's own weaknesses and one's own lack of strength. And I think that, you know, something that I would tell you is that, so I'll tell you the process by which it happened. Uh, so the, 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 this self-introspection, I'm a huge believer in self-introspection, in, in introspection in any way, shape or form. I think there's been an extraordinary strength in my marriage that, you know, there have been moments when my wife and I have not been able to agree on anything other than that we were both going to go to a therapist and discuss it or to a marital therapist and discuss it. That was it. I mean, we were, we were at our wits end. We didn't even want to look at each other. But we both agreed that we would go and, and examine ourselves with a therapist. And not all the therapists were good. I, I remember showing up to one therapist in, in Zurich. It, it was, it was, we actually, the funny thing is, Sean, is that united us. My wife and I, who'd been like fighting for like the previous two weeks and were really very unhappy with each other at that particular moment, came out of the therapy session, which he should have said, he was really bad. Well, he's like, yeah. <laughs> terrible <laughs> you, you, can, you can agree on the stupidity there yeah exactly but but i just tell you the story because i almost for myself it's an interesting story so i'm spending uh, a sunday in uh locust valley in long island and it is the weekend that princess diana has tragically died and i tell the mother of this friend um isn't this so tragic isn't this so awful i'm so sad and the mother says, that woman, that woman had it coming to her. She was passive aggressive. And I'd never heard the word passive aggressive before. And um, she was narcissistic. And she was, there were, there were all sorts of things that were incongruent about her. And I, I kind of like, I, I, I'd never heard um, somebody talk about somebody like this. So I, so I said, you know, what? Where, where does this come from? Where does this perspective come from? And she said, well, I'm, I'm a therapist and, and I can tell you that that woman's got an awful lot going on that doesn't meet the untrained eye. But if you're trained a little bit like me and I said, wow, that's amazing. Could you give me a book to read? And it's terrible because I don't remember the name of the book, but um, it was a, an introduction to Jungian therapy, but it was an introduction to Jungian therapy through the story of um, Tristan and Isolde which is a kind of a fairy tale uh, myth of um, a woman who goes off to Ireland. I don't even remember the story, but that, that triggered in me. So Sean, I started reading that. I read that, that introduction to Jungian therapy, and then um, I started having dreams. And I was one of these people who never had dreams. And uh, for example, one of my dreams was that uh, I'm with my family. So I'm living in New York City and I'm with my family around a wooden table and I'm shouting at my family. And so the husband of this woman is also a therapist and he and I are tennis partners. And I ask him about that dream and he says, well, you know, one interpretation is you're probably angry with your family 
and the wood on the table, the wooden dream, is kind of saying it's okay to express that anger. You probably ought to express it, which I think was was pretty close. But what what began was this this, this process of introspection and shining a light on what's going on internally. I found myself a Jungian psych psychotherapist whom I saw for a period of about 10 years. I mean, and and I think that that process of becoming introspective started there and has just changed an enormous amount in me. And I, what I would say is that even better than psychotherapy is writing because writing is this very powerful way. You have to examine the, your insides before you write anything properly, but, um, but you know, and once you start on that journey, if you're honest about that journey, you can't really stop, can you? And in a, a certain sense, the, the book is an emanation of that journey, if you like, um, yeah. Guy, you were mentioning before, the pain for you of writing, is, is this inner journey, self-reflection writing different than, than your style and, and type of writing that you do for a book? It's the only style that I know. So there's a there's a journalist. It's not the only style that one could apply. There's a journalist in the UK. Uh, she writes for the Guardian newspaper. Her name is Marina Hyde. Marina writes these utterly brilliant takedown pieces of British politicians, and she makes wicked fun, wicked fun. In that it's just, it. But 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 Marina Hyde. She's she's the, the, she, what she does is brilliant, utterly brilliant, but she's not there at all. She's her personality, who she is as a person. You don't know. You don't know. She's kind of like in a certain way invisible and it's utterly freaking brilliant. And maybe one day I'd get to meet her. Uh, and by the way, I don't share the political opinions with her, probably in many circumstances, but what she does is brilliant. I don't know how to do that. Uh, what I know how to do in a certain way is to show up full-throatedly as who I am, here I am before you type of deal, and here I am examining my entrails, so to speak. Interestingly enough, when William Green was writing Richer, Wiser, Happier, I urged William to be to put more of himself into the book than he did. He puts, he's not Marina Hyde, he doesn't hide, but, 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 he, but in a certain way, he's not full-throatedly there. He's, he's the eyes and ears. He's your eyes and ears as we observe all these other people. But there's a part of William that remains hidden. And, you know, I actually think, Sean, that I would have preferred, if I could have gotten away with it, I would have preferred to leave more of myself hidden than I did leave um, because exposing yourself to the world is painful. Uh, but it was the only way I knew as a civilian writer, if you like, non-professional writer to write something worthwhile that might that might stand the test of time and that might actually be a positive contribution to uh, the world of writing. So it's the only way I know how to write. And it happened to me, funnily enough, writing this year's annual report letter, um, which was the most painful letter I've ever written. And I basically told the readers, like, you know, I stand here before you as the guy who's you're compensating to manage your money. And you expected me to have been in the right stocks and to have predicted the crisis and to have known how, you know, and, and I kind of say, I did none of those things. I'm not capable of doing those things. But here are the two or three things that make me optimistic that we're going to do come out okay in the end with a few things. But, but that process of, because what, what, what I started off doing is, you know, you want to start off and we've all seen investor letters like this. It's like, well, you know, here's what I did and I did it right. And I saw this coming and therefore I moved the portfolio into, that's not my experience of it. That's not how it works for me, but the, the honesty. So getting to that honesty for me is not something that happens naturally. And I think that it's it's just it's a muscle that can be strengthened is the good news and you know actually i god I, he's so great james clear he wrote he wrote something i was reading it last night uh have you interviewed him no i have not i'm no, a huge fan of james's work yeah. but he's not been on the show yeah james you need to interview with sean delaney i just want you to know that but he says every action that we take 
is a vote for who we want to be in the future. So when you get up and exercise, it's not that that's going to turn you into muscle man or you know the fittest triathlete, but it's a vote for who you want to become. And every time you get up and you do that, you've cast another vote in that direction. And so the work of being honest with the world each time you do it is is a vote for being and having that honesty and the muscle gets stronger and so i think that becomes easier to do and i think that actually a muscle that i i would really like to strengthen in myself is is one in which i just write something every day because i think that there are probably some there's some things that I'd be sad if I'd not shared with the world that would be valuable, if you like. But and I, I've not been very good at casting those votes, Sean. <laughs> Have you ever tried just uh, speaking your thoughts? Yeah, that that actually works really well, really, really well. Um, so I I had I did a few. So so my little podcast was my lockdown project. And, and then one of the things that I did was in addition to interviews, I just, for example, took an email to my readers that I sent out and read it out, or I read out my annual letter to investors, or uh, I just shared some thoughts and put them up on SoundCloud. And yeah, that, that's, that's not, but there's, so that's fine. That's good. But, but at the end of the day, if you really want to decide what you think about something, you've got to freaking, I have to sit down and, um, work through it in a text, if you like, and that's bloody hard. <laughs> oh, it's very hard. I, I'm the same way. I, I've got to distill my thinking and it gets clearer and clearer and clearer. The further you go on it, the more you write. Um, it's, a, it's a painful process, though. It's not easy. And it, there's a guy that I really, um, I, I admire a lot. And, and it really gets to me, Sean, that the people I admire increasingly are half my age. And he, that's David Perel. I don't know if you've come across David Perel. Yeah, I don't know David personally. Uh, I've seen his work. He's he's got some great pieces he's written online. Um, yeah, and and um, he's taught me a lot about writing. It's just amazing. And um, so, why does he come up for me? Because he's inspired me to write more, actually. And I think every now and then I ought to do his course. He's got. It seems like the people who do his course do extraordinary, extraordinarily well. So. Um, yeah, I don't know why he came up, but he did. Yeah, no, I think I, I'm pretty sure the course is, I, I've not taken it, The Rite of Passage by David yes. Perel, I'm pretty sure is the course. It yeah. seems like a lot of people have gotten profound benefits from it. Yeah. I, I can't help but notice the amount of different people, ideas, thoughts that you've pulled from so far during our conversation here. And I, I'm wondering what this looks like for you um, in terms of just collecting different thinkers, ideas, thoughts, from, from varying and vastly different domains. Is that something you actively do? Or did you just happen to randomly come across a, a few of these interesting thinkers? I think that it's a great question. So, um, it, you know, uh, look, my, my mind jumps to things all the time. And I think that, and it, ju and it jumps so, so some people call it ADHD. So one of the things I've learned in conversation, Sean, is to notice when my mind is jumping and to give the other person fair warning that my mind is about to jump. Would they like to make that jump with me? Um, so I have a rule that, that when I um, notice a book, I kind of put it into my Amazon list and buy it pretty, pretty quick. And you know, a, a book should always be bought. Otherwise, it's sitting all lonely there in the Amazon warehouse. You know, we need to give it a nice home. It's kind of an orphan book out there. You know, it's like your eyes have come across it. So, you know, take the poor thing home. Don't don't leave it there in this kind of like. Um, and I, you know, it was something that I heard in a in Lincoln Square Synagogue in New York twenty years ago, which was uh, this rabbi talking. I don't know apropos of what, but. But if you know the, the the book always gets bought, the toy, the the luxury good, the whatever it is, but you always buy the book. Don't worry about spending money on books; it will always come back to you. So, you know, I'm I'm very impressed with Umberto Eco, who died recently, but he had this idea of the anti-library, and and you know the idea, so people would laugh at me and they say, "You've got so many books. Have you read them all?" And I'd say, "No, of course I haven't. I've read less than five percent of them." But that's the point. The point is, I, I don't need 
I don't need to have the books that I've read. I've read those. You want to have the books that you haven't read. So I think part of that is part of what you're picking up on is just to be extraordinarily liberal with the acquisition of books and to use one's library as a kind of a serendipity machine. So mm -hmm. I always I always find it very interesting when, um, you know, what is it that suddenly catches my eye about a book that makes me decide to read that book right now and not another book, which is kind of why I want books around me and I want to be able to move them. So I move them and, and actually we tried an experiment at my office in Zurich of sort of like ordering the books in certain, and actually I'm, I'm kind of the inclusion, I don't want them ordered by subject. I just want them ordered the way I want them ordered and I want them moved around where I want them moved around. And on some level, it doesn't really matter about finding them because if you really need a copy of the book again, you can go and get it on Amazon. Uh, so no problem if you can't, if you can't find a particular book. Um, but then I would tell you that, so, so I think that idea of, it's a bit like being a truffle hound, you know, huh, that might have something for me, I'll go and buy it and keep it at home or keep it around and then we'll see if serendipity results in me. I mean, another analogy that I've had around books is that your library is a bit like a, a, a cocktail party. Uh, so, you know, there's a, if you've got a thousand books in your library, there are a thousand people at your cocktail party. And, um, you know, some, some, you don't want to talk, you don't want to take every single at the co person you meet at the cocktail party home with you to have a like eight hour conversation. There are some people that you just want to have a five minute conversation. They're not the right person for you. That's the book that you flip through and put back on the shelf. And so what fun to have that cocktail party of books available to you. But but what I would say is that I think that I have, what I've done is I've gone about sort of like finding out about the world in a very haphazard way. And I wonder, Sean, if I had had a little bit more, if I was a little bit more um, structured about it, either because from my own impetus or with the help of others, that maybe I would have gone a lot further down particular lines of inquiry and thought and interest. And so, uh, so I think that in a certain way, I'm, I'm just a beginner playing in a sandpit. And maybe with a little bit more structure and knowledge, I'd be building some nice tall cathedral. But because I'm a beginner, I'm sitting in the sand pit. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm very much the same way. Uh, I have the same policy around books. If I see it and interested, if I hear it in, in a talk, I, I'm just going to order it. But uh, I, I have tried to get more structured in terms of how I distill down what I've learned. But I also think there, there's a point there around the serendipity. Um, if you weren't being so just open to different ideas and picking up different pieces here and there, maybe some of this, the serendipity and the interconnectedness of it all might not come yeah. to fruition for you. So, yeah, and it's funny. So I just, I'm looking back because I, so here's an interesting example. So Brett Weinstein, or is it Eric Weinstein, in one of his podcasts, he reads a book, he reads an essay by a guy called Arthur Kostler, who the, the, the title of this, the essay is We the Screamers. And Arthur Kostler is a, a German Jewish guy who's living in the UK, who's trying to call attention to the Holocaust and nobody's paying attention. And uh, there's, you can go on YouTube and you can hear Eric Weinstein reading it. And I, it was a fascinating essay for me. And so then I went and bought every single one of Arthur Kostler's books. So they're just, you know, they're just pretty much all of them are just here. And I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I'll flick through them at some point, but I'm kind of curious to see. It's amazing how many books get published that we, the current, if you walk into a Barnes and Noble or hear a, a, a Waterstones, such a small subset of the total books that one could read that are actually available. But then the other thing that I've started doing, and it sounds like you're doing something similar, is that I think I read somewhere that you're an active, you, no, maybe it wasn't you, you're in, but I use Evernote and um, it's, uh, and I'm, I'm blanking on his name. I feel bad for not remembering. It's somebody who's done, it's um, this idea of the capture habit. So uh, get quick and, and um, efficient at capturing thoughts when they arise and capturing ideas when they arise. And so I, I, I kind of started, I changed drastically the way I take notes about the world about a year ago. And I feel like, I don't know where it's going to go, but it's, I, I feel like it's going somewhere good. So you know, the concept of a, and, and so the, here's the guy that uh, if you've not uh, read him, his name's Arthur Sonke. 
or Paul Sonke, and it's it's about the Tettelkasten technique. And and I hope you don't mind. I'm looking it up. No, please right do. Now. Um, yeah, I'm always, I'm always so, intrigued by people's different processes. Uh, and then anytime you come across someone's who, who just seems to be so far better than yours and, and what you can learn from that. So believe me, I'm, I'm always open. And so are the listeners so, to hearing new ideas. So Sonke Ahrens is the guy. And um, the, the study is of a professor who was the professor at a German university who, again, my, his name just escapes me. And he had a system of um, three by five cars on which he'd write all sorts of notes. And he kind of, he described, he had like 80 or 90,000 of these notes on three by five cards. And uh, he kind of called it sort of like his thinking partner. And he kind of, in a certain sense, called it his serendipity machine. And um, there are people who've picked up on this. So this guy, uh, uh, Paul Sonke is his name, has, has kind of, no, sorry, Sonke Ahrens has uh, written uh, about this professor and his system and how the system can be applied today. And so, you know, another, another place, by the way, that kind of applies some of those techniques is, um, and it, God, it's, it's terrible. I'm having these, these mind, uh, these brain freezes. I don't know what you're going to do with them. You're going to have to maybe cut some of this because it's so useless. Um, so Rome Research, I don't know if you've you've kind of looked at Rome Research as a as a familiar with it. I, I, I've never used Rome, but I, I know a lot of people do. Yeah, so so it's this I I mean I think that these if we forget about the technology because the settle custom system is just pen and paper, but but I think that all of them are trying to find ways to um, work in conjunction with the way our brains work, and there are kind of specific things that we can do to improve our ability to think clearly about the world. And one of the places where it starts is this idea of the capture habit. So when you have a thought, wherever it is in the shower, write it down real quick. The idea that the thought's gonna stick around, we all know what happens. It just floats into thin air and then disappears. And so, you know, you could, if capturing thoughts is a bit like capturing butterflies, you know, you just gotta, you gotta, you got to grab them and preserve them while you still can. And then later on, you can kind of uh, take them out and review them and new things will come out of your thoughts as you review them. Um, so I think that, that there's a kind of a similarity between that kind of those systems of capturing thinking and, and developing one's thinking and having serendipity work and a library. So they kind of, and especially now that, um, you know, so much more of what we read is online, uh, on the Kindle. So we need to find ways to capture that. I mean, I actually, so, you know, just for your fun, I don't know if this is, and I'm fine if we put this up on YouTube, but I was reading this book by Avi Loeb, Extraterrestrial. And, you know, so I, I, it's a terrible thing. I, I, I dog ear the pages and then underline, I, a few things I underline. So I think that that's, all really smart because those are tactile, tactile ways of making the notes yours. And then I have, I have endless supply. I mean, I just happen to have them here. So this is a, this is a, this is one of my notebooks. That you can, I don't know. Let's see. The, you know, I'll just turn the page. Uh, where is it here? It's just like, and I stick stuff in. Yeah, that it seems like you, more, you have pictures cut out as well, right? Well, whatever, whatever inspires me, because you kind of want to make the pages yours. And what we've learned is that, you know, in the same way that the guy who built memory palaces, uh, and there's a there's a famous book about it, that the way you the way you make the thoughts yours and the ideas yours is that you try and find as many different mental pathways to connect them up. And so the written word is one, but pictures is another and um, uh, images, you name it, anything that it takes. And I've, I've actually found, I, I started using these notebooks. I mean, here's another one that uh, I'll just flip through. I don't know, can you see it? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can see that. Let's see, I mean, they're just, you know, what is, I mean, is, there's just, there's everything there. And actually what I do afterwards, funnily enough, is uh, this one is an old one. It doesn't have it, but probably this one does. So they get names, this one. This is number seven. And um, 
I create an index. I create the index after I've written it, and the index is often not on the first page. So um, the index here is <laughs> is on page thirteen, and I'll I kind of like create my own index for each of these books. I don't know where that's going, but it's certainly been an enormous amount of fun, and makes me feel better to do it. I think that. When we get our thoughts into onto a page, however inchoate and unformed they are, there's a sense in which we can relax. There's a kind of a relief because the thoughts are no longer, we're no longer exerting mental energy to hold on to them. They've been yeah. they've been captured. So now we can just relax and let it go, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I have multiple journals similar to you. And then even on, on my phone, I have the, the notes tab and I have certain things just titled thoughts. And the second it comes into my, my mind, I just, yeah. I just have to get it down. And one of my favorite things to actually do is I even have, I, I've got a lot of different different things, as, as you can tell. Uh, but one of them, I just keep a, a Google Doc, and it's weekly thoughts and new learnings. Um, and one of my favorite things to do is to go back in and, and reread those time and again. And, and it's funny how you see these ideas you captured months, even years before, in a completely yeah. new light. So the, the biggest difficulty I have, Sean, is that um, is to be consistent in doing it. And I think that I go through phases where I'm not consistent. And, and actually, I would tell you that one of the great benefits for me of being in a structured environment, the great benefits for me of being at university was that the environment forced me to be structured about those things. And one of the reasons why it was beneficial for me to move to Zurich is that I could structure my life in that environment far better. And now we're spending quite a bit of time in London. I've been kind of stuck here because of the quarantine rules, but also our children are at school here. And in a, it, we have a second home now here. And in that new home, I still haven't developed the habits. The habits are there for the old home, but they're not there for the new home. And so I kind of have to reconstruct or construct anew the habits that will work for me in this home. And uh, for example, in the in Zurich, one of the things that works for me, and is and this is I think straight from James Clear, is you know get up and put on exercise clothes mm. because that, that increases the probability that I'll do some form of exercise by an enormous amount. And here, for various reasons, I don't do that, and I haven't yet found a comfortable way to do it. The house is just set up differently. So, uh, but the 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 I mean, one of the most difficult things that I have is that. To come to the computer, which is where I can write the notes most effectively, is also it's also a place of social media and email and YouTube. And so how do I structure it such that I go to the notes first and the email, YouTube, all those other things later, you know? Oh, it, it, that out. Yeah, it, it's difficult for sure. One, one of the uh, the frameworks I enjoy is around having rules instead of having to make decisions. So every day you have a rule, you sit down when you're finishing your work day and, and you write down your thoughts, your ideas. I found when I have rules, it's way easier than end of the day or beginning of the day, I'm extremely tired and I'm trying to make a decision. Hey, I'm going to go do this. And, and I just know how flawed I am that most of the time I don't follow through with that. But if I have a yeah. rule around it, um, it, it seems to be easier. And, and funny enough that we're just going back to the thank you notes thing. That's what I, the rule that I had with the thank you notes. And it was was don't leave the office without having written three thank you notes. And I think that, you know, the, the, that rule was the right thing for me at the time, but the rules can change. Absolutely. You know? And mm -hmm. so, um, and actually, when it's an interesting study to ask, well, given that you can only have a limited number of rules for yourself, what are you going to choose? Because for somebody else, it would be, you know, a day that I don't make money is a bad day. And I have to kind of like do over until I make money. Which may be okay if you're if you're struggling to make ends meet, for example. So, what are those rules? And I I, I think that probably for me it's around writing, although I hate to admit it. <laughs> it no, yeah, I, I'm intrigued by all of this, and it's funny we were kind of talking about like the ideas catching them like butterflies. I, I've realized in myself, my, my inner journey, uh, when when there's inner tension, stress, things like that, my ideas aren't flowing, and so I can actually go back in and I can see it points where there's a week and there's barely any new ideas being generated. And I realized, hey, I've got to address something else that's prohibiting and blocking that idea generation process. Um, I, I found that within myself. That's really interesting. And, and what are those kinds of things that you've had to address, Sean? Uh, if I may it, be so bold as to ask you a couple of questions. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, absolutely. No, I had one uh, in the last two weeks um, in, in terms of one of the businesses uh, I found it and operate. Uh, we, we had someone 
really important leave, it, it really put a strain on the business. Um, and so I look at my like past two weeks, I went through my weekly learnings and thoughts and I had a 10 day gap there where I didn't even put anything down. Uh, I just had like too much I was trying to figure out otherwise I was wrestling with. And like, to me, I'm like, whoa, like Sean, you're not operating from your best self. So it's kind of like, how do you, how do you eliminate some of those stress points so that, right. and then once, once I did all of a sudden it was like, all right, ideas are starting to flow. And those ideas also help solve the problem I'm dealing with. So I, I know that's kind of a long winded way of some of the things yeah. I, I deal with and how I think I'm through. No, that's it's really interesting because if we go to uh, Jerry Seinfeld for a second, I mean, what I is he's famous for is this idea of chaining days of writing. So how many days in a row can you get of having written something? And that in a certain way is a rule. And the simple rule is, I mean, and it seems like he spent quite a bit of his life living by that rule. It's just, I'm going to end each, by the time I get to the end of the day, I'm going to have written some material, you know? And I yeah. remember when I was writing the book, how many times I'd sit down with the rule of 500 words a day. And I'd literally start writing, you know, you know, this is garbage. This is garbage. I can't write anything. I'm so useless. And three out of five times, I'd start like that. And then suddenly something would come up. And then there would be some something good there that I would continue to write with. But um, yeah. You got, you got to get those bad ideas out before the good ones come in. Um, exactly. I, I, I even know you, you wrote about this in, in your book. You, you've got to talk about the uh, the old Sherlock Holmes analogy. Uh, the mind is like an, an attic filled with old furniture. You got to get the old furniture out before the new ideas, the new furniture can come right. in. It's just the, a concept I love. But Sean, the old furniture is so comfortable. Yeah, and right. It's so familiar <laughs> and it's so nice and it's so painful to throw it out. Why would I want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> It, it, I, mean, it, I have, just, this, no, I have this continue. interesting thing now that so I started about three years ago with an email newsletter I thought this was a good thing and uh, I started using a piece of software called get review which has now been bought by Twitter uh, and um, you know and and the first sort of like email I was really amazed because I discovered that if I put an assortment of things together people really were interested in what was going through my mind and so the email list grew. And now Substack has come along. And there are some people who write for Substack, which is like, they are really good writers. And they, they, they write some amazing newsletters. And I just think if my rule is I'm not going to send something to people's email inbox unless there's something new and, and possibly, hopefully, likely worthy of their time. And so now I'm just like psyched out by all these amazing writers on Substack because like why on earth would anybody want to receive an email newsletter from me? And, and I've seen how some people start with high hopes for a newsletter, but they end up recycling what's already out there. And, and I know that I don't want to go down that path. So what am I trying to say? Um, I, it, it's not just that writing is painful. It's that is daunting for me. It's, it's, it's daunting. I mean, when I write something, I'm basically saying to somebody who might re spend the same time reading one of Paul Graham's essays, and I'm saying to them, no, read this. You know, this is worthy of your time. <laughs> well, speaking of worthy of time, I know we've kind of talked about some of the, some of the books behind you. What do you deem, all, all of your experience, what would you say would be worthy of your time to go back to again? Are there things that come to mind for you? In terms of reading? Yeah, we, we can stick. If, or there's something else that you're like, hey, I, I listened to this. This was unbelievable. Um, I, I think that, you know, um, uh, a friend of mine um, is professor of mathematics at Zurich University. And um, he, he was, I think it may be a, an essay by somebody, the unusual effectiveness of mathematics in explaining the universe. And I, I don't have a reference. I haven't read the essay myself, but the unreasonable effectiveness. So mathematics has been unreasonably effective at explaining so much of what goes on. I mean, so many, um, you know, if you can like the Stokes Napier, um, equations, the equation for gravity, the equation for the speed of light, um, <clears throat> you know, quantum mechanics, the mathematics behind quantum mechanics is not trivial, but it actually explains what is going on 100%. <clears throat> that is extraordinary. 
So mathematics is really an amazing subject, an amazing, amazing subject. And I think that I was exposed to the same mathematical thinking that any graduate student of economics and of a high school in the UK would have. But I actually feel like there's an awful lot that's missing there that I'd like to go back to. So, uh, so I started reading about complex analysis and I pretty quickly realized that I needed to go back and do um, a basic calculus course. And then for some reason, I, the, the book that I was reading, it take, took me one step back and I'm now reading up on set theory. And, you know, just the, the ideas behind set theory on the one hand are so simple, but on the other hand are really very powerful thinking tools. And I actually think that I would be more capable of thinking clearly about the world. And I'm talking about the very practical aspects of the world that we deal with every day, if I had done more mathematics. And so I actually think that um, going back and studying more mathematics is something that I want to go back to, if you like. And there's a, there's a couple of video um, YouTube channels which do a really good job of making anybody who watches them, I think, exciting, excited about mathematics. The one is called Three Blue, One Brown. Three Brown, One Blue, or One Blue, Three Brown. Forgive me, I ought to have the name right. Um, the other is Number File. But, but I, I, and then those, those two video channels will give anyone who watches them, I believe, an enthusiasm for mathematics. But I think that neither of them will uh, replace what happens if you do a proper undergraduate course and you work, go through worked problems and you try and prove things and you try and solve things. And so going back to stuff, I think that's something that I would certainly urge anybody. Well, I urge myself, my future self, I think will be grateful to me for having done more of that. The only question is how, um, how disciplined I am about doing it. Uh, I would tell you that in the last, so it sounds like you're asking about kind of like what, you know, reading list for listeners, if you like. Believe me, we, we all love reading lists. So yeah, if, if you're willing to, to give a few recommendations, we'll take them. Um, so I, I decided that I didn't want to die not having read some of the great classics of world literature and a few years ago, I decided this, and there were a number of books that I felt like I ought to have read and had not read. And I tried two or three times to read War and Peace and it failed each time. And then on a trip to Russia, the one family trip that we did to Russia, we visited Tolstoy's birthplace, Yasnaya Polnaya, Yasnaya Polyana. It's about an hour or two's drive south of Moscow. And uh, I can send you a photograph if you ask me for it of me and the family there. And you know, it's not the main house on the estate because in typical Russian fashion, Tolstoy lost the main house in a bout of drunken gambling with a friend where he gambled a house and basically that house was no longer his. So he was living in one of the less important houses on the estate, which is just hilarious, which is where he wrote um, War and Peace. But, but I would tell you that I, I have, so I, re I read War and Peace. I needed like a good 10 day stretch at like a hundred pages a day. And I read it, we, we took a trip to the Antarctic as a family and I had planned for the, for the crossing of the Drake Passage, three days there, three days back, I would be reading War and Peace and I pretty much finished it on the way back. But that book, because what happens, Sean, is that First of all, the book is set in a very real period of history. It's set uh, during the time before, during and after the Napoleonic invasion of Russia. And so there are, there are characters and events that are real, real events. So, you know, he describes, for example, the Battle of Borodino. That was an actual battle, battle that happened between the Russians and the French. He describes the Battle of Austerlitz, which is a real historical event. There's a but at the same time, he traces the lives of these personalities through these vast swathes of history. And over the course of the book, these people kind of become your friends. You kind of get to know them 
really, really well. And you get to see how their lives are intertwined with history and how their characters intertwine with the other characters, but also how they intertwine with history and how there are things that they can and can't avoid based on sometimes the events are too big for them. The events kind of overwhelm, but sometimes they're bigger than the events. So long story short, I feel like I, I wish I'd read that 20 or 30 years ago, because I think I'd have had more wisdom about many other things, because it gives a perspective that um, I, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. And so another book in this sort of project of reading some of the world's great classics. So I just recently re read The Magic Mountain by, um, uh, why is it Thomas Mann, who's this sort of like Nobel Prize winning German author? Yeah, you know, um, to read that book is so, so the, the whole freaking book, Sean, takes place in a hotel not far away from where we have a ski home. Uh, so it takes place in a hotel in Davos called the Schatzalp Hotel. All the action, every single bit of it, bar like like two scenes. And um, seven years that this guy stays in this hotel. But in a certain way, the hotel's kind of a microcosm of the world. And so to read the book is to make yourself into a European. You become more European and is to experience a kind of an aspect of European malaise that anybody who spent any time in the in the US kind of despises. So it, it, it was a combination of um, becoming more of what I believe I am or a part of what I believe I am, while at the same time learning about some really extraordinary and interesting characters in the book and do, you know who represent different approaches to life in the world. And um, so, you know, I, I, you know, and part of this, Sean, is me. So Charlie Munger, so when you have a hero, uh, they, I don't think that the person is a real hero for, you, for at some point you don't kind of hate them for what they've done and hate them because it's like you can never touch them. So at so, on some level, if the person's just your hero and they they bask in your adulation, I don't know. There's something not that doesn't entirely sit there because there has to be a point where you say this person's my hero, but I can't touch what they've achieved, and therefore I'm annoyed at them because because they're so much better than me at whatever it is. And of course, the answer to that is always how do you beat Bobby Fischer at chess? Play him at anything but chess. Yeah. So the answer that's the point at which you have to say, well, the hero has served me. But this feeling, this emotion means that I now have to differentiate myself from them and become the best version of myself rather than try and become who they are. So a part, an aspect of Charlie Munger's personality that's kind of rubbed me the wrong way is that he says that he doesn't read fiction. Mm -hmm. And I took away from that, you know, my response was, damn it, this is there is enormous benefit to reading fiction. And I don't agree with you, Charlie Munger, that fiction's not worth reading. And so that was kind of like me deciding to become the best version of Guy Spear who does read fiction. I would just tell you briefly, I don't know, this is kind of goes way back to our, in the part of our conversation where we were talking about introspection, but I just think that it's a, it's a kind of like a value bomb. The uh, what is the the, the guy uh, entrepreneur on fire? He calls John Dumas. He'd call these a value bomb. So, but I think uh, I, I still so emotions are a call to action. Uh, emotions are clues as to decisions that we have to make and things that we have to do. And but the initial reaction to the emotion that we feel is often not the one that the action that we need to take. So. Yet again, an example of me sort of like wanting to pull away from Warren and Charlie is that Warren and Charlie have this line that they've used a number of times at the Berkshire annual meeting where they say, um, envy is the worst of the seven deadly sins because, you know, at least when, when you engage in envy, envy, there's no enjoyment, yeah. you know, at least when you engage in, you know, lust, greed, at least there's enjoyment, whereas envy, there's no enjoyment. Envy, I think, is perhaps one of the most useful of emotions 
because envy is a so if we're angry it's a it's a sign that our boundaries have been violated and and we have to lash out well we shouldn't lash out if our boundaries have been violated the right thing to do is to go into a careful thoughtful state figure out what boundaries have been violated and what is the action i need to take to reset this uh, sadness is 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 probably an, an an indication that we need to seek comfort uh so what is envy envy is i think is one of the most underrated emotions because it is a signal you don't feel envy for somebody i don't feel envious of um somebody who's achieved something that i'm not capable of achieving uh i don't feel envious of um uh who's the guy who run the, who ran this the 100 meter sprint in the fastest way possible oh i uh, usain bolt yeah i'm not envious of usain bolt but we feel envy when there's some part of us there's when we know that we actually could in some way be similar to that person but we haven't achieved it and so um one of the non productive responses to envy is to be spiteful towards somebody or to but to say wow i'm envious of that person i need to go and examine my own life and see what changes i need to make and what things i need to try and do because i think that once you get going on your own path and in dealing with that envy you no longer feel envy because you're the man in the arena now and you're out there figuring out your own future so why did that come up for me because i think that you know a, a very non productive response to my kind of charlie munger rubbing me the wrong way would have been to sort of say well he doesn't know everything you know and a productive response is to say well no i'm going to actually prove him wrong for myself by reading some great works of literature and getting something out of them in spite of the fact that he doesn't think that that's a good idea or he doesn't it's not worthy for him to do so i that came up for me i have no idea why it came up but mm -hmm. i hand the mic back to you to see where you take the conversation next no oh, guy <laughs> i i love the framework uh all the, all of your conversations it almost seems like shining new lights on, on different types of ideas and thinking which is what i love uh we're we're going to put put a bow on on round 1 here but you're so good at pulling and extracting wisdom so i would love to know if you were going to spend the evening having a conversation like this just talking anyone dead or alive just not a family member or friend who would you love to sit down with oh wow <laughs> i mean i've not had i would love to sit down with charlie munger i think that i think that he's got an extraordinary mind and i think that um you know th there are these uh so at the time that bill ackman was investing in valiant and he was talking about valiant being this extraordinary company and it turned out to be a kind of a fraud uh charlie munger was very clear that he thought very little of the company and and it kind of like i go i want to say i i you know how did he do that because he was accessing the same materials that um bill ackman was accessing but he saw something that bill ackman did not see and bill ackman is no dummy so i think that i would i would love to i i feel like i if i could get to spend time with charlie munger i would learn an enormous amount from him in that regard but uh i think that you know in terms of in terms of heroes i'll i'll just give you and and you i i just for the listener sean did not say that he was going to ask me this question so i didn't get the chance to think about it but you're quick on your feet guy <laughs> <laughs> i'll tell you a story about nelson mandela that for me is got a lot a lot of application for all of us that that was really interesting for me so first of all you know uh you don't have to visit robben island but it helps to visit robben island and see where he spent that 20 or so years of his life and to understand that he spent a good few years i don't know how long it took in a state of anger anger at the system that had imprisoned him and but to understand the process by which he eventually stopped being angry and how he stopped being angry so so the man that emerged from prison to become the president of south africa had conquered his anger you know, he he'd done an inward journey he'd truly stopped 
willing ill on his imprisoners and on the system and the people who had imprisoned Nelson Mandela and was imposing this enormously unjust system on the country. How did he do that? Uh, is something that a story that I don't think has been well told, even in his autobiography. I don't think it's a well told book. I would love to, would want to learn how he did that. And I could imagine myself sitting in around a fire somewhere, around an open fire pit, talking to him. I think that would be great. But here's something else. And I think that his autobiography doesn't capture it. None of his biographers have captured it, at least not to the extent that I've been able to see. So when he was in prison, Sean, he starts developing a correspondence with songwriters. And it is, it's utterly brilliant. He's figured out that if he can encourage songwriters to write songs of resistance to apartheid, and if he can provide um, uh, encouragement and moral support, which he did do, and, and there's a wonderful movie talking about sort of like stuff to look at. So A Revolution in Four-Part Harmony is a, is a, is a musical history of, the, um, of South Africa to the end of apartheid. And it, it has some of these musicians talking about their relationship to Nelson Mandela and how he would write to them and encourage him to write certain kinds of songs. And what you'd get, what you had was a situation in South Africa where you had um, uh, African South Africans working in white people's homes, singing songs of resistance that the white people didn't understand. And they were quietly resisting the inju un injustness of the apartheid system uh, with those people not knowing it, singing songs that had been... So that for me shows an extraordinary mind of somebody who is in prison and he's figured a way, out a way to empower change uh, far away from his prison cell uh, and to get societal change. And I think that somebody who's capable of thinking in, that, in terms of that kind of deep strategy, and if we talk about, if we go back to the act of writing thank you notes, you know, or kind of I say, yeah, well, you expand the envelope. It goes from thank you notes to maybe founding entrepreneurs organization or something else. And there's a guy who's sitting in prison encouraging songwriters to write songs for some unknown future that he has no idea will ever happen. He may have spent the rest of his life in prison, or if it had been a worse regime, he might have been executed. And um, so, so what is the mind that does that? I think that he's somebody that I would have very much enjoyed talking uh, this, to. This is why I love so much exploring your thinking. Uh, I always, always walk away with just an unlimited amounts of, of new wisdom here. Uh, so, I, so I appreciate this so much. I hope this is only round one, uh, what turns oh, out to be I'm, multiple conversations. Sean, I'm happy to talk to you as often as you like. I, actually, for the listener, what I would tell you is, and this is really a special with you, Sean. So um, one of my investors, actually, I had a call with her recently, and she's got a meditation practice, and she's also got a, pra a listening practice. And so listening well is a form of meditation and it's a form of loving kindness to other humans and it's a kind of a gift and I would tell you that Sean you're an extraordinary listener you've um, it takes uh, a very special quality that I'm really curious to know where you got it from to be able to create the space the mental space for somebody to express ideas to ask them questions and then to let them go and, and, and I just want to tell you that it makes me feel like I'm talking to that investor of mine. You're extraordinarily good at it. Just want you to know that. Thank you for doing it. But also maybe you want to share with the listener, how did you learn to do that? Oh, well, that's incredibly kind. Uh, one, one of those types of moments where you're kind of lost for words, how to respond when someone you respect so much uh, says something like that so kind. So that's, that's to me, uh, yeah, I don't even know how to follow that up. But um, I, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Um, it's kind of one of those maybe subconscious type things. I'm, I'm not even fully aware I do. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm incredibly lucky um, in terms of the parents I have, the values, the lessons they taught me. Uh, I have to assume a lot of it's come from there. And then just honestly, from curiosity, uh, I, I could just ask you one question, hear you talk for hours, and I would walk away. 
uh, so much better off than if I try to interject too much. Um, so I don't know. I, I really don't have a good answer for you, but I, I'll tell you one thing, Guy. I appreciate the hell out of that. That means a lot. Well, you, I, I, it's actually on my agenda is to learn to be a better listener. And, you know, my children, they, they catch me interrupting so often. And it's really an awful habit. It's not a very nice habit. And um, I think the good news is that you can become better. So there are many things we maybe can't become better at, but we can all become better listeners. And, and it's just actually, and the reason why it's fun in this conversation is that you know, we're, we're talking about finding ways to play the infinite game. One of the ways we play the infinite game is in every interaction we have with people, we give them uh, the feeling that they won in the interaction. They came away with more than they, than they had to put in. And um, I think that what is so beautiful about this idea of giving the gift of listening is that it's free to give. So I get students and um, people early on their careers. And I kind of say, look, you want to have these interactions with people where they come away feeling like you're a positive thing in their lives. And their answer is, but I got nothing. I got nothing to give them. I don't have knowledge. I don't have money. I don't have insight. I'm just some university student who's maybe not even graduated. What can I give them? And the realization that giving somebody the time to listen to them properly is it, it's it, uh, so sorry, Sean, I'll just give you another thought, which I think is, has got, we could spend a whole podcast just talking about this is what I see in Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett is that so many of their actions have multiple levels of meaning and have multiple levels of um, smartness about them. So if we take this idea of giving the gift of listening, um, that, you know, that hopefully, you know, Guy Spear talks to Sean, Sean gives the, him the gift of listening. Guy feels great because he feels like he's been heard. And I, I genuinely do. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. But also, you're making, you're bringing peace into the world. Because, because when people feel like they've been heard, I believe I'm very closely connected to the conflict in the Middle East. If we could take every single person who feels aggrieved in that region, and there are many, and just hear them, just hear them. Uh, I think that, you know, tension and opportunities for conflict would go down enormously. And so this, the idea that we all can give the gift of listening is probably part of building a better world while at the same time being long-term greedy. <laughs> so it, it does both. And that's that multiple level. It's, it's kind of like creating a peaceful world while also playing the infinite game. And when you kind of see opportunities like that, we should certainly take them. So, uh, well, Guy, I'm certainly going to be spending my weekend um, exploring the, the gift of li to listening a bit more. Um, I, I'm so glad you expanded on that. But, but Guy Spear, I really cannot thank you enough. Where do you want the listeners staying connected with you? Um, oh, that's really kind. Um, so uh, the, uh, uh, I think that I'm I'm really quite active on Twitter. I like Twitter, so you know my handle is G Spear on Twitter, and that's probably a good place to interact with me. and And I enjoy the conversations that I have there. I'm obviously on LinkedIn and on Facebook, and you just Google me and you'll find me. And I do have an email list, and I'm struggling with writing a an update right now. And if that's on, um, I mean, you can find it all if you go to my Twitter account. There's a link there that will take you there. So I just send you to my Twitter account. Absolutely. We'll have that linked up uh, yeah. along with your book, The Education of a Value Investor, of course, where, where the listeners can stay connected with you. But Guy Spear, uh, th this was a really impactful conversation for me. So I can't thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. And thank you so much, Sean, for listening to me and for having you on your show. It's a real privilege and honor. Yeah,